Uh, well, it would, but yes, yes. In other words, the total RMS error in the eye would add in the diffract refractive error. But see, like if you're minus six, that's six times more than you're going to get from all the higher order aberrations, so it's not enough to show up. So uh, the RMS here is again in diopters. So what happens is over here, this is showing you that this person's over a six millimeter pupil has a variation over the surface of the corner of 0.31 diopters, the whole eye. Over here, it doesn't have the RMS value, but I can tell you it'd be a lot less because the refractive error would go away. But the main thing is, this is what's left after you take the refractive error out of the whole eye. Okay, that's, that's all that's trying to show. All right, so that's the first map. Second thing is the topography. Now, when we look at the topography map, again, this is the instantaneous. I think that's valuable. Here is the refractive. It shows he's got some power changes getting stronger out here as his eye moves out. And it shows that there's some mild irregularities here, but pretty good over the central three millimeter zone. That guy's gonna have pretty good vision because the stuff out beyond the three millimeter zone are not as important optically. Internal, got some little cortical changes out here in the eye that are radiating out, little cortical cataract out there. It's not really cataract, just some cortical changes. And here is the green curve. The purple curve is if I do just a higher order and subtract out the, the sill and the sphere. And the red curve is what he is if he has no glasses on at all. So the values here are going to be 72% when he's got, um, when he uh, has his glasses on, and it dro 121%, and he drops down to about 72% when he puts his glasses on, when he takes his glasses off. So about 50% of that change is due to his refractive error. And 71% is fair. It's okay optics. It's not great, but it's okay. He puts his glasses on and he sees pretty good. But again, you can look at these curves and tell something about the performance of the eye. All right, another normal patient. Now let's look at this guy. Again, two pictures, higher order, whole eye. This is what I can't fix with glasses. And I know that because this is on a quarter diopter scale, that these values are within plus or minus a half a diopter. So what I'm telling you is, this guy's got higher order aberrations on the level of plus or minus about a half a diopter over the surface of that cornea. That's helpful, because you've got a feeling for that in terms of the effect that it have on a patient's vision. When I tell you it's RMS error about 0.31 or point, you gotta know the pupil size and on and on and on. You never can figure that out. But this is what the whole eye is. Topography. All right, nice little bow tie right here. This is the refractive map with the rule of stigmatism. Tangential map shows you the detail of that. And right here, Testing. Oh, we're out of power, probably. Let's go to the other. This is going to hold that thing. We're going to get a headache. This just goes over one ear. It does. All right. Now, look, let's talk like this. Can you hear me now? We okay? All right. So, the point is here's what we've shown here. This is showing us some changes in the lens. Now, look at this. This is showing that over the five millimeter zone, uh, this guy's got about one diopter of astigmatism right here at about 60 degrees. When we looked at the whole eye, we saw that he had about uh, 0.8 diopters of delta K over the three millimeter zone. And so those are pretty close. He didn't have too much. Most people have astigmatism that's more in their cornea because the in, than they have in the whole eye because the crystalline lens is usually opposite astigmatism that you have in the cornea. So it's about a third. Most people that have one diopter of astigmatism in their eye have one and a half diopter in the cornea and about a half a diopter in the lens in the opposite direction. It's just about a third. And what I'm gonna show you in this patient is just that. This guy's got 
about one diopter, about one diopter of astigmatism, and we can see right there. When we take that away, he's still got a horseshoe and power on the top. Now let's look at the topography. Where did that power on the top come from? Right here on the cornea. So we know it's not lenticular. And we see he's got 1.75 diopters in the cornea. And that's because he's got 0.75, right here about a half a diopter of astigmatism in his crystalline lens. So the half a diopter in the crystalline lens is opposite to the 175 in the cornea, and that's why he's about one in the whole lot. Most people are like that. Most people have about one third of their corneal astigmatism in the opposite direction in the crystalline lens. That comes from a study we did about five years ago with Doug Koch, and it's in the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery on evaluating and reporting astigmatism. All right, now let's look at a cone. All right, we're looking right here. Those don't look much different to me. Do they look different to you? Pretty much the same. So what does that tell us right off the bat? It tells us if the higher order map looks like the whole map, a pair of glasses isn't going to help this guy. That's what it means. And sure enough, in keratoconus, you can put a pair of glasses on somebody and they're not going to see any better. Now, it is true uh, that he's real myopic, but most of his problem is due to the aberration in the eye. Now, here's the effect on the power of the eye, and here's the effect. That's actually the geometric shape. Now, what you see is here, this, the instantaneous map is the one that shows you where the nipple of the cone is, all right? You'd think it was right here, wouldn't you, when you looked at that refraction? This is the effect on his refraction, but that's where the nipple is, right there, and he's got a little flat spot up on the top. Now, why do you get a flat spot on the top of a cone? From the lid, moving over that 16 times a minute, 24 hours or 16 hours a day, and even at night. What happens at night? It probably rubs off more at night. What does your eye do at night? just before you start dreaming. What it's doing is the back lid's polishing off the top of that thing. It's a nice way to get the epithelial cells to do a little extra smoothing overnight by getting the eye to do like this. Now, I don't know what all the reasons for REM sleep are, but I can tell you one of them is to polish off that central area and help the epithelial cells spin around because that's the motion from that. And it does it during the night. If your eye didn't move all night long and stuck right to the back of the lid, what do you think happens when you wake up in the morning? get an epithelial erosion with that epithelium coming off because it sticks to the back of the eye. So the other thing it does is keep things from sticking together overnight. But anyway, it's normal to have less elevation on the anterior surface than the posterior surface because the epithelium gets thinner as it's rubbed across by the lid and it doesn't do that on the back surface. You see, because of the epithelium. Now, we see, now here's what I was showing you before. Here's the first internal map where we've got some changes down here that are pretty much a result of the cone. The cone changes the back surface of the cornea. So the changes that we see down here on this internal map are mostly from the back surface. And look at this guy's MTF. There's normal. Here it is with glasses. There's without glasses. This guy's not going to see well when you give him a pair of glasses. And we know that. One other thing that's kind of a deal. How many of you done cataract surgery on a paper with keratoconus? Anybody ever done cataract surgery on a cone? Not a transplant, but a cone. Well, here's the point. When you take a K reading on this guy, you're going to get numbers up around 58 because it's taking it from right there. You think the guy looks through that 58? No. That's a bifocal cornea. He's got 58 diopters of power here, and he's running about 50 out here. Well, what happens is, if you ever take a cone patient, you test their distance vision, you put a minus six pair of glasses or whatever they are so they can see as good as they can, and then you have them look up about right here. They'll be able to read. Now, why is that? Because now they're looking through the bifocal. They're looking through the cone. So when you do an IOL calculation, you don't use the K readings that you get from the cone. You, you take the K readings that you get around the cone because that's what's going to be the patient's distance vision as you go through the day. You never take the K readings on the cone because that's going to make the patient end up hyper open. And I want to thank you for being here today. Thanks for showing up. <laughs>